Hello and welcome to the Unofficial Controller Podcast, your weekly gaming podcast, episode 160, WSD Live, Stroke London Games Fest. But what about E3? With me, George, and as always, joined this week by RGT. Exciting game show to my photocopier industry event. How's it going, sir? Very well. Busy week, but a good week. How about you? Oh, well, yeah. It's a, a good week this week. Mm. Obviously, we'll talk about a little bit into the show, but we went to London Games Fest, including WASD yep. Live. Uh, but it comes at the same time as we find out E3 has been cancelled. So interesting mm. week and certainly a day out of the office for you and I, which came with its own issues, restraining orders, uh, gagging uh, situations. And I'm not talking like legal gagging scenarios. I'm talking about, uh, let's probably not talk about that. It's a family show. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and it, an interesting week, one that saw us go down to the big smoke. Uh, and a story about Shuye Hoshida, which mm. obviously industry legend wins a BAFTA, also meets podcasting nobody, a.k.a. Yeah. me, uh, while well, you watched on in horror as the ensuing carnage <laughs> ensued. Uh, <laughs> let's not mess around. Let's cut straight to the chase. Odders, grab your Sh- Shuye Yachip. If he's listening now, we're done. Shuya Yoshida's teeth in. teddy bear. I as ask RGT, what have you been playing? Oh, uh, finished Hogwarts story. I finished the story. Um, uh, it's quite good, actually, um, because one of the strong points of that game is combat. So the actual the end boss and the fight was good. I enjoyed that. Tough, but good. Um, but I've just got... I guess you took the Wigan Wells with you. Oh, yes. Loaded them up. Got in the old room of requirement and just <laughs> made a batch ready for that. A bit little big workshop, but for potions. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was good. Um, I've got to get, I think I'm level 32. So I've got to get level 34 to do. Is it the House Cup? Hogwarts House Cup? Oh, maybe, yeah. Which follows on after the story. So I'm just going to do that bit, I think, and get that done. Um so I've been going around doing the um, finding ancient magics and destroying um, enemy foes, you know, the wizard foes you can find for a map to get rid of them, to just try and build myself up to 34 so I can get that done. Um, but yeah, good. I think it's a, I think we said before, we've gone over it a lot of times, but I think it's a solid 7 out of 10 game. Um, did enjoy it. Had weaker parts to it, but... Yeah, you know, I think any game that you put them hours in and finish it, there's got to be something there for you to enjoy it. So, yeah, yeah. enjoyed that. So, you know, it's it's it still left me a little bit empty, if if you know what I mean. It's, yeah, I felt guilty. I mean, just to roll, you know, what I've been playing into the what you've been playing. I also finished it, and uh, when you got to the sort of cutscene after, I kind of felt a little bit sort of guilty because it felt quite poignant, you know, with their deputy head stepping up and speaking on behalf of the headmaster and other things. I was like, oh, yeah, that, that kind of – I almost want that to get me in the feels, but mm. it didn't. And I think yeah. that might sum up Hogwarts in one sentence. I wanted it to get me in the feels, mm. but it didn't. What else have you been playing this game in week? Um, it's been a, been a little slim pickings this week, obviously, because we've been busy boys this week, haven't we? But um... – I took my switch down to London. I started playing. Um, I haven't played much, mind you, but I did start playing Live Alive on my switch. So um, I started off with the, because obviously you've got your, I can't remember, six or eight different stories throughout time you can play. Got mini, mini little RPGs. I started on a prehistoric one. Um, I put about half an hour in. That did not grab me whatsoever. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so, but I thought, no, I want to give this game a go because... I like the idea of it. So I've gone into the futuristic one. You can pick them in any order you want to play them. So I've gone into the futuristic one where you're like a little robot on a spaceship and people are in deep space and they're now waking up from their um, That's a cool stasis. concept. Yeah, so I've started playing that and that's really got me. That's, that's got that sort of little, makes me think of Red Dwarf a bit and being in deep space. So um, I've started playing that one. I'm quite enjoying that. I must say, graphically, it is stunning, that game. That sort of 2D pixel characters in a 3d um sort of backgrounds looks phenomenal and that's always got this sort of focus blurry sort of action in the distance as and its clarity as it comes closer to you 
it does look stunning. That's such a nice art style. I mean, I think they've done Octopath Traveller in the same sort of engine and, and they've got Octopath Traveller 2 out as well. That's good. Yeah, so I'm, I'm starting on that futuristic part. I'm enjoying that. That's more up my street, I think. So I'll play play through that little mini game and then see how we go on from there. And I don't know which one. There's, there's a Wild West one and I think there's an 18th century one and um, ancient Japan. And so I'll see. We'll see which ones I'll go to next. Um, I played a bit of um, Switch Online with the Game Boy. Actually, actually, been playing Tetris. <laughs> when it's a when it's a classic, there's yeah. no dispute in it, and that game is an absolute classic. It took me back to having my Game Boy, being in Spain, and my family, and we were just passing around the Game Boy, even with my mum and dad trying to get the highest score on Tetris. Just that music and that start screen, and I and, uh, just yeah, ended up playing. Just kept playing Tetris and enjoying that. So that's been good. And I've been playing my hidden gem. I got a bit absorbed in the hidden gem this week. So I've been playing that. But that's that's pretty much all I've played this week. Okay. Well, before you launch into the your hidden gem and I have to dust mm-hmm. off the Michael Elfwick like tones. <laughs> uh considering he's six foot under, that's probably the best description of my singing ability there <laughs> has been. Uh so I finished Hogwarts. I think you know we've we've said enough about that. We, we spoke for hours about that, and um, and probably that that game will probably haunt us. But uh, yeah, the ending, like you, I kind of maybe felt the dragon was a bit. You know, you have your sort of um, Rockwood duel, which felt a little bit more as I wanted maybe the end boss to be. You know, duel in magic, it felt correct, but he went down too easy, and then Ragnarok's dragon uh form had about three to four evolutions of himself before it was done yeah and i did, i felt that i kept thinking ah oh, got him and then you move to the next section yeah oh. so you get and, again think ah oh, got him down oh hang on i've got to go somewhere else now <laughs> and even in the big boss room i was like okay this is this this is the arena this is it do 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 done oh no we're not done another wave mm. and then another wave after yeah. that and i was like oh my giddy am you know this is quite the challenge mm. now whether they expected someone like me to maybe get a little bit more sucked into the side stories along the way and be a slightly higher level i think me and the dragon were equal level so it, it was a challenge yeah um but you know afterwards like i said the poignancy of some of the cut scenes and some of the sacrifices made along the way they kind of all added up and i did feel a bit guilty i did feel a little bit like oh Am I disrespecting this? Because this feels right. The tone, the timbre, everything was right. But uh... no, I think you're right because I think they 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 sort of back you in a corner a bit. Because if you go in, I went in there at what thirty two, and that's a tough battle at level thirty two. So they're basically saying to have a good experience and a and a not easy battle, but I think you've got to go in there thirty six, thirty seven. But to get to level thirty six, thirty seven, you've got to gr- seriously grind the hours in the outer world, which isn't. I say grind, it's not a bad grind. There's plenty to do. Um, but when you're going out and clearing areas and doing bits out in the wilds and you're getting 100 XP, which is hardly moving your level up, you've got to seriously <laughs> put some hours in to, to have a really good spell, at, you know, and have a really good go at that boss. So that yeah. is, I find that a bit, that's a, how can you put it? Um, it's a bit unleveled, if you know what I mean, as as so um you, you have to you have to put a lot more hours in just for that end boss whereas the rest of it you're overpowered i found yeah i was going in late missions that was recommended i, I agree you're 26 that- 27 and then suddenly the boss is 30 and you're like well hold on, i'm only two levels above him and that's he feels like he's stronger than that yeah up until that point the game had almost been too easy so the mm. ramp up in difficulty towards the end or in that last boss did feel a little bit misplaced or it took me by surprise. I thought, well, you know, Rockwood went down. This guy's going to go down. And then in that, in that fight, I was like, this guy's not going to go down very easily, is he? <laughs> this is awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is what it is. The thing, clear the decks down, because everyone wants to know about this, you know, in the UK. But the US listeners, US listeners, BTW, you need to up your game. Else, the Netherlands has ramped up. Germany's ramped up. To our German and Netherlands listeners, thank you. What I would say to you is, 
spread the podcast around in your area like smallpox. Get it, get it round and about. Smear it on door handles. Leave stickers everywhere. Tell your friends. Get your mother's, uh, mine or mother's phone. Get it downloaded. Get a sub, sub to all the shows. Download all the shows. You never know. She might want to listen to the Star Wars special, the PS5 Rises from uh, all the way back in the dim and distant past. And um, that would help us massively. Mm. And if we want to see the countries face off in a league, the UK is still clear winner. Germany in second place. Netherlands in third. USA in fourth. These countries of pride. No one wants mm. to come last. Especially not me. So what I would say is, you know, keep it, keep it going. If you want to represent your country, start telling all your friends, start mm-hmm. telling your neighbours, start stealing phones from maybe disadvantaged family members and subscribe to the show and then and then delete the app or whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> but, you know, let's, come on, let's raise it up here. Yeah. Uh, so all the European listeners, all the UK listeners, I'm sorry, USA listeners, it's time for some baseball talk. Uh MLB 23, we spoke in the week, obviously, mm-hmm. on our way to WSD, and it was I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, uh, no. Had a ropey start to it, didn't you? It's, there's new controls. There's new parts oh, okay. of it that I wasn't too sure about. Some of the fielding you have to grab in this sort of, the classic sort of golf thing of the rising into the green and then stopping it in the right place and things. And it's a new, oh, Okay. I don't know whether I didn't go through and select my specific MLB classic style of playing on the way through, but certainly these new controls make it more of a challenge. Uh, is, that a good, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it certainly makes, it, I play the game as a pitcher so often can lead to me sort of just pressing a button and, and, being more on the strategy element of where to pitch, how to pitch, speed, off-speed pitches, inside, outside the zone. Um, that strategy element of it is still the same and, and still the most joyous thing I can extract from it. But certainly mm. in the other modes, you need to be aware and a little bit more on it. You can't just sort of sit back, you know, if a ball goes into play, you, you've really got to be on it to make sure you're getting it as quick as you can, that okay. you're fielding it to the bases in the right speed they're catching it and, you know, dead in the ball off. So it's, yeah, it's wonderful. And for the first time due to the other additions in there, I've been exploring some of the other areas. Like I've normally sort of ignored Diamond Dynasty. This time round, I'm finding it sort of sucking me in more than um, Road to the Show, which who would think that possible? Mm. Um, but Road to the Show hasn't been touched, but it has. There are some changes there that you and I spoke about that I found a little frustrating. Uh, the setting up of the draft and and things like that seem to be not quite as good. You know, maybe one day I'll I'll speak a bit more in depth about that. But um, mm. yeah, the Negro Leagues as well is great. So well curated. The the footage looks I- I- incredible. Uh, the narrator delivers the lines with knowledge, and and uh, I do believe he's the curator of the Negro Leagues Museum, actually over in America. And their involvement and, the, like I say, the historical footage really builds a picture of something really great and it drops you in at that moment. Now, I spoke to Seb a couple of weeks ago about my nervousness around this, where it's the modern-day commentators, but they're talking about it in like a retrospective style, almost as they're watching a video of it now. Mm. Um, the crowd are all changed, like they're wearing shirts and ties and the ladies are all in smart blouses and the sort of scores are not the computerized versions we have now. It just literally looks like a like a traditional scoreboard that you'd see at a baseball event, but obviously mm. done in um, like a more simplistic style. Mm. So yeah, it's it's very classy, yeah. and certainly as a I've had a lot of these games now, as you know, and never have mm. I really dipped into Diamond Dynasty that much. But this time, through the medium of all these other things, I dipped in. He got it hooks in me and pulled me a little further in. And I was like, oh, this is actually, there's been a lot of game I've been leaving on the table here with my obsession to road to the show. So that's mm. that's very, very exciting to me. So Give yeah. it more playability as well, having that extra mode, that, you know. It, it's the, I don't know, I'm very on the periphery of it at the minute, just working it out, but I'm loving the ways of getting the cards. I'm loving the sort of modes that I've kind of within Diamond Dynasty that I'd ignored before. So, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's more of a, a broader package, but allows me to 
dip into more of the things that historically I've ignored. So, yeah, I think uh, mm. overall, is it better than 22? That game sits in my heart like a songbird in a tree. Mm. Um, for many reasons, it brings me, yeah. you know, a lot of happiness. But this one, I think over time, is a more solid package and I think will eclipse it. So, yeah, yeah I'm excited to see where it goes. One thing everyone's excited to know where it goes is... <clears throat> <clears throat> la 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 <laughs> here we go RGT yeah he's like the lone ranger riding on down to bring hidden gems to me <laughs> oh you've been practicing that's a little flourish at the end there oh uh, very good that was like an X Factor audition you yeah. just have to give it that little bit extra yeah. to get the judges to look at you. Lady Parkinson smiled in the village. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. the, uh, the Dower Duchess. She is pretty good on stage. And that final flourish, yeah. she actually stopped me in the street. She says, I don't know what you're talking about on the podcast, but that singing section, it needs an 18th mm. century flourish. It sounds like you've had coaching, especially in the vocal department. And it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm impressed. Actually, a bit emotional. I'm impressed. If this is what your emotion looks like, I'm pretty much dead. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get all of that out of the way. Tell right. me, gaming brother, tell me what. Or are we going to do Guess Who again? Well, I'll start. I'll see if you guess. This was, uh, this is on the Sega Saturn I was playing this week. Mm. Mm. 1995 single player game by Bell Corporation no no little, little flight simulator game flight simulator game mm-hmm. they call it flight simulator mm. it's a flight game yeah which is I find quite unusual on the Saturn because it wasn't known for its 3D work. It was more of a 2D powerhouse, but this is a 3D game done very well. Give me more. What is this? This game is called Wing Arms. I've never played it. Yeah, it's um I mean it's had mixed reviews in the past. A lot when that first came out, a lot of the magazines rated it quite highly, you know, it was sort of seven and a half out of ten. It's story the story what we'll get the bad out of the way. The story is meh, you know, it's not you don't play it for that. It's it's just a little half-baked story. It's basically after a sort of an alternate World War II in 1945, all the, all the planes that were supplied by a company called Avalon. And after the war broke, after the war finished, um, they obviously weren't so popular making all these planes. So they sort of tried to keep the, the war going on so they could keep making making these planes. So it's a quite a weak story. And you're, you're based off a aircraft carrier and you have to go and take out the Avalon and and make sure you bring them down so they're not not carrying on with the war. Um, but the actual, the, the I mean, they have cutscenes in here which are almost comical. The cutscenes it looks like it's been drawn on an Amiga on the paint. <laughs> paint. A lot of that transitionary period do. PS One yeah. is guilty of it. PC games from that era are guilty of it. The Saturns, yeah, you got like, guilty of it. Got like, like the admiral of the ship is talking to you face to face. He's got shoulders that looks like. Um, like I say, someone's done it on Mario Paint, and then he's wow. got a tiny head, and then his his mouth is just completely out of sync to the terrible voice actor that's voicing the admiral. But so why you, are we checking this game out? As for the gameplay itself, it is literally a dogfight simulator. So once you're out there, especially on the first mission, you are um, taking out enemies, um, and it is very good. The controls are fantastic. You can play it in either. Um, like a chase cam behind the plane, or you can play it in the cockpit. I play in the cockpit. Um, and then you'll get, if someone's chasing you, you'll get an alarm start going off um, that they're on your tail. Once they are locked on to you, it goes to a chase cam with their plane and your plane, and you have to dodge and get out of the way and break that line of contact with that plane. And then you go back into your cockpit view. Um, very, The controls are fantastic. Um, it's a very good game game to play. You'll go through different missions from dogfights to destroying enemy bases. Um, and it's for how, you know, I say this most weeks, retro is 
expensive at the moment, and this is an affordable, decent flying game for the Sega Saturn. Um, and Saturn price is a bit like the GameCube, if you know, going through the roof now. So this is a, an affordable one. You can pick this up. If you can get this under twenty pound, you've done well. But anywhere around about twenty pound, you can get this game. Mums, it's time to reappraise the Sega Saturn collection. Isn't <laughs> that <laughs> it's twenty pounds worth of game. I remember yeah. when you couldn't give Sega Saturn games away. Even very recently, there was still yeah, like for the vast majority of the obviously there's the big hits that everybody must clamour for, but the vast majority of the rest of it was one to ten pounds oh, maximum. I mean, you go things like Deep Fear, which is the the last PAL game produced for the system. I mean, three years ago, even two years ago, that was a three hundred pound game. That's now creeping up to five, six, seven hundred pound game now. Um, they're they're going up in massive leaps. Bring so, forward the retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that is an affordable, decent 3D. I might add Sega Saturn game. So, yeah, give it a go if you have got it or you're playing it or you're going to purchase it. Jump on the Discord. Let me know. See what you think. Tell me that I know absolutely nothing about games in the community correction. Say, RGT, what are you on about? This game is terrible. Who recommended this? Who do you think you are? And Get you'll just corrections. probably yeah. point to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like George, I told me, George told me to it. say it. <laughs> Okay. George, these are all George's games. He's just trying to get the price up. <laughs> oh, wow. What a conspiracy. Is this what you're doing? Ooh. I wonder Ooh. dangerous creatures on the Wii. Like, what games yeah. do I own that's got a low print run? Yeah, that. Let's hype check, this up. Check my eBay out. I've got Deadly Creatures, Crimson Skies, Wing Arms. <laughs> you're a little bit like Metal RGT Smells. That's your <laughs> new... <laughs> A man who's just single-handedly trying to raise his own uh, <laughs> no, I definitely would do that. price. I definitely would do that. But okay. yeah, check it out. See what you think. Well, with that all said and done, it's time to kick into the news. We scour the very darkest regions of the internet to bring you the latest stories. First up, sneak in during the night and suck your soul. No, I'm not talking about the Dowager Duchess. I'm talking about this week saw the return of the BAFTA Games Awards in the UK and the biggest prize of the night was scooped up by an Xbox console exclusive, beating the likes of Elden Ring and God of War Ragnarok in the process. Who'd have thunk it? That game is Vampire Survivors, which you can play with Games Pass right now. The team had a few words to share about the receiver in the award last night, which you can watch in the video uh, of the night. Xbox boss Phil Spencer also offered up his congratulations. He's a big Vampire Survivors fan. Uh, I've not played it, but I know Seb raves about it. Uh, here's the list of games that were nominated for the award. So Vampire Survivors, which won, was up against Call to the Lamb, the mighty Elden Ring, um, the runaway success on the PlayStation system of God of War Ragnarok, the mobile uh, Marvel Snap, which has been also a roaring success, and the multi-format release Stray. Uh, elsewhere, Elden Ring won the Best Original Property and Multiplayer Awards. Tunic scooped the Artistic Achievement and Debut Game Awards. Plague Tale Requiem won the Narrative Award. And Vampire Survivors also took home another game uh, award for game design. And you can see the full list of winners over on the official BAFTA site, as, as well as the aforementioned video. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention Shuya Yoshida won his Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm. Close and personal friend of yours, George. He is now. Yeah, yep. Whether he knows it or not, he is. <laughs> he, he, yeah, I'm on his hit list, probably. Yeah. I, I've Before an event comes up, like people to be aware of, you know, his yeah. security team. Yeah, yeah, this guy. Just yeah. be aware of this guy. And we'll get to that when we get to, we've got a little bit of a, a chat about the news about E3 and uh, we'll we'll talk about some of our own takeaways from London Games Fest. Um <laughs> Vampire Survivors, it was at WASD, um, mm -hmm. running, looked great. Uh, again, probably not my cup of tea, um, mm. but uh, certainly looks exciting. And, and to be fair, punching real well, considering that, you know, historically you might expect, a, you know, a 3D story game to capture that sort of light. Yeah. And, you know, don't get me wrong, These some of these other titles also shared other BAFTAs for other achievements within gaming. But Vampire mm. Survivors took the big one home. Um, mm. Really, probably a great accolade and probably 
the takeaway for me is that sort of, uh, and we've always known this, we talked about gameplay with the Saturn game, but gameplay wins out. And unlike yeah. maybe the movies, you can make a low-budget game or a seemingly more low-budget game uh, and get it out there, a more simplistic yeah. style game, and get it out there and still get the chance to win. In cinema, that would probably rarely happen. I know that you know small indie movies yeah. do win the Oscars, but more often than not, they kind of struggle to compete. Yeah. But in this scenario, they don't. What's your takeaway from all this RGT? Oh, I think it's brilliant. Because um, beforehand, everyone would have said Elden Ring, God of War, you know, they're going to come out with a title. But having someone like that is fantastic. And that gives gives the smaller studios that, that ambition to say, yeah, we can. We can win a BAFTA. Yeah, if we do sure. if we do it right, we make the game properly, and you know we make it tight, and it releases in this best possible um, place it can be. We've got a good chance of of winning. Shines you know? a good light on Xbox Games Pass as well. Definitely, yeah. Um, it, it, you know that's that's a great game to have on that system. Plus, also, it's if you're a subscriber, you've got that day one, and it's an Arab after winner. You know that's that's brilliant. That's a brilliant sales point for Xbox and Microsoft because that's. You know, we have the BAFTA winner on here, the only place you can play it, you know, so it's fantastic. Mm. Excellent. Mm. Okay. All right. Hit me up with this next bit of news, RGT. We don't do leaks and we don't do rumours. <laughs> <laughs> That's a flashback, that one. But apart from the fact that we do now. Yeah, apart from this one, but we don't. <laughs> Aside from a handful of state of plays, we've barely heard a peep from Sony in almost two years. We know games like Marvel's Spider-Man 2 and Marvel's Wolverine are in development, but aside from vague comments about The Last of Us standalone multiplayer spin-off, we have no idea what the rest of its first-party teams are up to. In fact, the roadmap for PS5 is largely non-existent outside of third-party stuff, and that's without even touching on PSVR 2. We're long overdue some kind of presentation from the platform holder, then it looks like it may not be far away. Giant Bomb's Jeff Grubb, who's notorious for largely reliable inside information, claims there'll be a proper PlayStation showcase prior to Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest, which is currently pegged for 8th of June. Obviously, that leaves a pretty large window for when the event could take place, but it's good to have a rough idea. Grubb has previously mentioned that the Japanese giant has been saying the good stuff for this show and given out uncharacteristically quiet and given how uncharacteristically quiet the company's been, expectations will be sky high. There's chatter about this setting up phase two for the PS5's release schedule, so it should be much bigger than your average state of play. Of course, none of this is official, officially confirmed by Sony, so temper your expectations until it is. Personally, we reckon the firm needs a pretty big presentation. It managed to get away without one in 2022, but we don't think it can coast for another 12 months without some proper, meaningful updates. What would you like to see from a hypothetical PlayStation showcase? Uh, are there any games in particular you are dying to see revealed? Let us know in the Discord. Mm. Okay, well, I agree with you. They need to do something because we kind of know the length and depth of what they've got hidden away so far based on what they've shown. Yeah. Um we kind of know the names, you know, Wolverine, Spider-Man 2, all that sort of stuff. We know we've got the factions or whatever they're going to call the Last of Us spin-off yeah. coming out. There's a hell of a lot of PSVR 2 they need to cover off, unless that's going to be pushed over worse than the VR 1. And, and and can you believe it or not, probably worse than the Vita. I'm getting a little bit nervous at this moment. I've got uh, <laughs> a lot of money sat in a box in the gaming room. Yeah. I'm thinking, oh, Sony, what are you doing? I know it maybe didn't do gangbusters out the gates, but you can support and grow this like you did with the PS3. You didn't just abandon it and announce the PS4 the week after. You didn't do that. Mm. So I, I know want... with Sony, though, they're very, whether it's PSVR 2 or even come down to the stars thing that's on, you know, the stars that we have on the PlayStation apps and bits and pieces, they never pump them enough. They're no. very quiet with their... Well, uh, that's, look at that's it this strange. way. I've had over 15 quid in voucher out of that PlayStation Stars program in the last week. Have you really? Yeah. No way. Get on there. Make sure you do all the coin ones. Mm-hmm. 
if you're going to do a digital purchase, which I did with MLB and I've done with some other games that, you know, for, fortunately, stroke unfortunately for me, Amazon pushed me in a corner where I wanted to play a game day one. It didn't turn up. So I was like, okay, this is ridiculous. And I had I did cancel some physical versions and some I just let come that I thought, well, I want that because mm. I like that game or whatever. I'll put it yeah. on the shelf. Um, but where I've bought them digital. Now that makes my skin itch. Um, but it is what it is. And I've yeah. also obviously been playing remotely on a PS4, so I've been bundling things in. Don't forget, I oh, took advantage yeah. of some vouchers yeah. to go for premium as well, which adds the extra coins in for that. Yeah. Um, so if you start adding, though, we're off track here. We're way off track. Mm. If this was a road trip somewhere, I'm we lost. <laughs> 100 yards into a wood <laughs> and we've just got stuck yeah i think we need to engage reverse call over brian's garage get him to drag us out <laughs> i don't know why all the season one references are coming in today but you know <laughs> they're in my mouth so they're gonna but, well, i know what you mean but i think you're basically saying that you know even me i haven't even looked that far into it because sony doesn't tell you you don't no, know i don't know why but i've i've I regularly check that little app. That's again, <laughs> George. You said you were going to reverse, but you just engaged first gear and you've driven harder into the wood. I know, mm. um, but you know, I go on probably once or twice a day. It doesn't update that often, but if mm. I see a coin one and I've got the game for it, I'm doing it. These add up quick. Mm. Um, yeah. So just keep ratcheting those up and then checking your purchases. And don't forget, even a one pound, one dollar ninety nine, one pound, one euro, whatever purchase counts yeah so keep them keep them coming mm. in regards to the what i want to see at the summer games first i think that would be the right time obviously we're going to talk about the wsd live and our thoughts and, and feelings from that but also you know the cancelling of e3 and with the cancelling of e3 and and studios not just sony's but you know mm. independent studios as well or, or large publishing houses as well don't get the chance to get their games out they don't get you don't get the physical hands on as we used to so mm. and as we said we've started to pass a lot of the destinations that or nearly all the destinations that were mentioned when the PlayStation 5 first launched so we're at the end of the first roadmap mm. and us and the industry need some clear markers over the next 12 18 and 24 months about what to look forward to what to be excited i've got a good feeling strong feeling strong feeling Mm -hmm. that there's going to be some surprises in this that either we didn't know of or will take us by a massive amount of surprise. I think so. I think normally when Sony are this quiet and have been for a while, you normally have a couple of bangers dropped when they when they put their state of play up. So I can see probably something there where we're going to go, oh, hello, where's this come from? Didn't know about this because I think the things they want you to know – you know, your Spider-Man 2s, your Wolverines, we know they're being made. They'd let you know that, but sometimes they will drop the odd the odd banger, which I, I hope they do, and I think they need to. And um, They need to keep that, you know, they've, they had, you know, we've been lucky with them. Last year we had a good run of games, I think, coming out on the PS5. There's plenty to play, but I think they need their first-party titles now to start. Start they they not only need the first party titles, but I think we're now in that point of time. We're now officially there where it's time to drop the um, the joint releases on PS4 and PS5, as much as that will sadden me, because I, I like the ability to... This sort of interim period has been great mm. for just mix and matching. doesn't matter what yeah. console you're playing on. You can carry on your, your efforts. You can stream between the consoles. It, everything's yeah. going gravy, but I've never heard the PS5's fan kick in yet. No, I think you're right. I mean, even like games like Hogwarts Legacy at times looks absolutely stunning when you're in the, you know, when you're in the map room and places like that. It looks gorgeous and, you know, your ray tracing bits and pieces look good, but you're not working that PS5. No. You know, they're, they're start making games that maximise that PS5. And with the PlayStation 5 having the same setup between the digital and the disc version, they can. Obviously, yeah. Xbox is a bit different with the Series S. That's a this, bit of an anchor to that. But for the PS5, they can. Let's, let's see it. Let's, let's go for it. Now. Let's have a game. PS5 only. Apps, you know, I, I want saw, to see smoke coming out of it. I do. And I saw an Unreal Engine 5 tech demo yesterday mm. where mm. the... Uh, they had like a, a Rivian 
an electric four by four that you can drive uh, that they would drive ah, okay. through this. And they talked about the procedurally generation and all that all that sort of stuff that it was creating. But for me, the takeaway was the minute micro details that that Unreal Engine yeah. Five is pumping out. And I thought we've seen close, yeah. But I haven't seen this, yeah. A massive game with that, yeah. That's what I me and Mrs. RGT we saw um we saw an Unreal Engine Five and that was that was going through like I think it might have been an Italian village, and they were going between the actual footage and the Unreal Five engine footage, and unless you went right up to the screen. You couldn't tell. That was almost photorealistic. And I was thinking, if we could have a game that looked like that. In VR2? Yeah, that would be impressive. I want to to hear that fan almost take off that PS5. Make it sound like a pro. pro. Yeah, Yeah. make it sound like a pro. (laughs) Yeah, go on, girl. That sounded like the... With the go on girl as well, that sounded like a farmer encouraging the mating of his cow herd. That noise... Go on, girl. Yeah. Yeah. I'm from deepest dark to Suffolk, so that's, <laughs> that's skills you need to know. <laughs> if, we, if we went down a wrong turn with PlayStation Stars, I have took us... <laughs> I don't know where I've took us with that comment. I'll tell you yeah. what, let's, let's grab this next bit of news. You tell us what you need. Japanese publisher Koei Tecmo appears to be eager to bring more of its release to the top tiers of Sony's subscription service. As in Wolong Fallen Dynasty survey... Uh, as in a Wo Long Fallen Dynasty survey, it asked respondents to reveal which titles it would like to be added to PS Plus Extra or PS Plus Premium. While it's pretty generic marketing research, it clearly suggests the publisher is considering making more of its software available to members. There's quite a lot to choose from, from Fatal Frame, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse, Blue Reflection, and more, and the more recent Atelier Riser titles, which all would all be excellent additions. There's also Fairy Tale Attack on Titan 2 and the Ninja Gaiden Master Collection 2, to be fair, Koei Tecmo is a pretty strong supporter of PS Plus with various Dynasty Warriors and Dead or Alive titles available to download right now. Is there anything particular you'd like to see added? We know Neo is also available on the service, been on, uh, on the service before, but it's good to see the PS5 upgrades added on a more permanent basis as well. As always, join us in Discord to share your thoughts. But before we do that, RGT, what are your thoughts about these sort of developers reaching out to people through the medium of games they've already purchased to ask them about how they want to represent themselves on the... Now, this was obviously... This was in here because evidence found for PS Plus and and that's great. Obviously, independent surveys also taking place from publishers for what people want to see on Games Pass. Yeah. Is this good or what? what's going on here? Do we need to engage with them? Should they not just drop the whole library or do they want to cherry pick the best ones and then try and work a deal with Sony or Xbox based on that? What's going uh, What's going down? I'm not sure. I think, I, you know, I think within the games industry, we do at times still have a lack of communication with the gamer themselves. Because sometimes you have services or games that are released and you just think, who wanted that? You know, where, where did you get, <laughs> you know, so I think in, in one way it's good that they're communicating to find, you know, what people want. Um, is it cherry picking? Yeah, maybe, you know, get your popular titles on there. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, there's a few games I haven't played there I'd probably like to play, but that's another one of them. Will you get around to playing them? Don't know. But no, mm. I think it's good. I think it's good they're engaging with people. So that's, that's, that's always a plus because... Then you you know you will find out what your consumers want. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Do you like video games, podcasts, and reminiscing? I'm actor, video game writer, and total sweetie pie, Connor Savage McCabe, and on each episode of Call Me By Your Game, I sit down with a guest for an intimate look at a special game from their past. Did you and your dad beat Spyro the Dragon over the holidays? Or was Halo 4 the one thing that united your roommates during your senior year of college? Stories like these are what Call Me By Your Game is about. From video game content creator Janet Garcia to Hades voice actor Courtney Venez, I interview wonderful comedians and game industry friends about these memories. Check us out wherever you get your podcasts, and maybe someday you'll call me by your game. Never ask the consumer what they want. If they'd done that back when <laughs> Pong came out, we'd still be playing Pong now. <laughs> Set would have a bigger wheel for turning the thing up and down, and maybe there'd be three colours on the screen. Yeah. Uh, if you ask people about how they want to refine the product that you're giving them, 
you're just going to end up with a refined product of the product you're giving them. Always mm-hmm. give them something that you don't think that they don't think they need until yeah, they need it. Um, yeah, yeah, but in terms of engaging with people and pumping out content that you've already created to a service, maybe this is the right way. Mm-hmm. Maybe this will stop the head scratching of like, why is that on there? Yeah. You know, why on earth is that game on there? Prime example, that Grand Medieval Dynasties game on PS Premium. And I thought, oh, yeah, an RTS, great, by any metric. And I'm not being harsh. I'm sure the developer tried really hard and all that. Great. And, you know, I'm sure it's review, it's sales in the wild back up the effort they put in. I'm sure yeah. they do. But to find that game on PS Premium is a little egregious because yeah. graphically it was broken. <sighs> Gameplay wise, it was about as entertaining as watching a bowl of rice pudding slowly go off and develop mold. And I like strategy simulation games. I do. Mm. But well, sometimes that... find that's a bit that's it's hit and miss to what you know both subscription services put on. And I'm sure sometimes for something that they pump for people to become a member of, you sometimes find that so they just close their eyes and put a pin on a list of games to see what one they're gonna put on. Scary. Mm, it doesn't seem you sometimes sometimes you get an end you have a fantastic week a uh, fantastic month that's been added and you think wow god f three brilliant games been going on and other times you just think why is that on there you know it wasn't good first time round it didn't sell very well why is it coming on here mm. you know and sometimes even in the same state it was in when it was first released so yeah it's it's an odd one with that as to how they get to <laughs> pick I don't know how they do that system. Do they just divide up a, a large amount of money and then once they've got that, got that, got that, they've got 4p in the kitty and they're like, what can we get for this? Yeah. Okay, Grand Medieval Kingdoms are cool. They'll dance yeah. for less than that. My name is Mayo. I love that this month. <laughs> if only that was on there. <laughs> yeah. Be the most downloaded game. I'm not even messing about. No, you'd be, yeah, you'd be right. That developer's probably earned millions from that. Literally, he's on a yacht in Nice somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Big cigar, driving around on his Bugatti, Top G style. Uh, and all he had to do was smash out My Name is Mayo. Yeah. Who's laughing now, kids? You got your free trophy that's worth nothing. Yeah. That, you, that you can't even look at on a digital shelf. Yeah. Uh, who's the bigger fool? Uh, yeah. But, yeah, so nice for a bit of engagement. I'd like to see more. Um, let's, let's feed into this next bit of news, Hero. What we got? Someone fetched said blood pressure pills. <laughs> Maybe it's a good job he's not on with this next bit of news. Mm, yeah, just glance my eyes over it. I think it could be a good job seven on. <laughs> um, at Nintendo's f- uh, February Direct Showcase, Sega and Atlas announced that they would be bringing the Tree and Odyssey Origins collections to the Switch eShop on the 1st of June for 80 US dollars. Mere sniff for a eighty US dollars. A brand new game. Uh, the game's price point has raised some discussion online, and in a recent interview with IGN, Sega of America justified the cost with the amount of content and gameplay players will get out of the three-in-one package. Here's the fu- full exchange. IGN, based on some early attention on price point, why $80 to purchase the collection? Sega of America replied, yes, the collection is available for purchase at $80. With this purchase, players will get 30-plus hours of gameplay of Adrian Odyssey HD and 50-plus hours of Adrian Odyssey 2 and 3, plus DLC portrait sets of popular characters from other Atlas IP when they pre-order. That is a lot of content and gameplay that we think players will be very excited for in the first three games of the remastered series for Nintendo Switch and Steam. If you don't want the 4K $79.99 or £71.99, fortunately, the three games will also be available to purchase separately for £35.99. That's pounds. Yeah. I mean, wow. Atlas milking the back catalogue at the moment, but one wonders if that is a particularly good deal. I suppose when you look through the lens of 35 99 each, if you get the whole package for 
you're loosely kind of maybe winning, possibly. The idea, uh, but for me, I mean, they're, they're going down the content route. The amount of content you're getting, yeah, but normally games are expensive because of the development time to do it, which they haven't had. They've had no. that development time. They've had a, you know, a limited time to read. Uh, I mean, maybe this is remastered? maybe this is the bare cost of bringing a mastodon of a game like this. Maybe there's more in it than we realise. Maybe it's maybe. more complicated. Maybe taking that game, getting it up, resed and running, going back and retouching the artwork, making it pretty. Maybe we don't. But normally, remasters or re-releases, remakes, not so much, but they're normally a more of a budget title. I know you're getting more games than this. I mean, even back in the PS2 and original Xbox days, you had Capcom collections, you had in television collections, they were budget titles and you got 20, 30, 40 games on them. You know, they had to be touched up to play on them systems, obviously. Um, but they're now going over to this side where they're charging 80 bucks mm. for a game that's already been made. And I'm not, that seems a bit of a cash grab to me. I might be wrong. There might be extra content in there people don't know or fans of the games. You know, there might be extra bits for them, but mm, that seems that seems a bit pricey to me. Me too. I brought it on here to illustrate the point. Obviously, you mm. can pay damn near 80 bucks for the new Zelda, or you can pay it for this. Mm. We had Zelda on, and we highlighted the egregiousness of the pricing, which I personally didn't have an issue with, to be mm. honest, if they can justify it. And it, it kind of looks like they can. Mm. Although, in a discussion with a, a former co-host of the show, Tom, in the week, um, he said, oh, look at the amazing things they're doing. And I went, okay, so we're paying all that money for Zelda's take on Minecraft stroke Banjo-Kazooie, but not quite as good. And or they've put a game out with the developer tools left in. Uh, the ascent through mounting, the ability to click things together. Um, Nintendo, I'll give you a pass for now. And I'm mm. sure everyone in the industry is going to get around this and rave about it in a review and say how amazing it is. But to me, it just le looked like they'd released... Breath of the Wild with the developer tools on. Yeah, I know. What you mean. I I did quite like the trailer. It looked quite good. I'm. I still don't think it needs to be seventy bucks. I think it needs to be the same price as any other first party Switch game. Why that's got a sudden jump up in price? I don't know. Because still, this is the price all first party Nintendo games are going to be going forward. Yeah. Once I, I, I would imagine they will be, especially when, when come the, episode the two thousand and twenty four, and we look back at this and think, oh, we were actually quite lucky getting games for eighty bucks. Now they're two hundred and fifty pound each. Yeah, maybe, but I think it's more of um, a generation thing, and you normally tend to have the games uh, priced for a generation. Sony and Xbox made that jump um, because they had a new console out, so the, the games price went up. Um, whereas Nintendo seem to be trying that while they're still on that system, which is, but I suppose if you've only got, you know, I mean, PlayStation, uh, obviously still to this point, releasing PS4 games, Xbox is still releasing Xbox one games. Um, switch hasn't got that. The switch are just releasing switch games. So if you want it, that's where you're going to have to pay and you're going to have to, you're going to have to get it I suppose. So it's like, they can set that marker because you can't get the cheaper version. Mm, okay, well, community corrections. I was just, I was slightly distracted there because I was buried in community corrections. And apart from an argument with Bobby about how MLB games are actually good, I don't think we have any um, community corrections. So that's good news, unless you have one. You look like you've got one. No, I don't. I was trying to think if there was one this week. I couldn't remember. It might have been the week before. So Flawless Vic. Flawless. I know your, um, your mistake from the other week with Adabinkster's team was then carried on into the community corrections with the game and Graham who <laughs> was still saying the wrong teams <laughs> mate look like... I know Bada Bingster's a massive fan of Interpesto so it doesn't matter anymore we've sorted it we've made peace okay we've made peace what is it what is it then Parmaham into my lad that's what I said yeah you did I know he's into his ham. I don't know why every time I mention into pesto, you bring up he's into ham. <laughs> what sort of ham? Parma ham? Don't you turn this on me. You're, you're on your own on that one. I knew everything. I know everything. Okay. All right. <laughs> yep. 
Anyway, RGT, tell us how the collective masses can interact with us and, and where we want them to go and what we want them to do. Um, right, if they want to interact, they can go and send us a message at questions at unofficialcontrollerpodcast.com or they can DM us on Instagram or Twitter or the main way now. We've had quite a few more people coming into the uh, Discord this week. Grimming, we did, isn't it? We did have the special draw this week. Yes. So, um, yeah, so get on the Discord. Come in there because rather than have to send a message, you can just, once you've joined in, you're there all the time then and you can you can just chat away, ask whatever questions you want. Tell me that Wing Arms is an absolute pile of pap and why did I even recommend that? Um, you can just say what you want. So, yeah, get in the why Discord. Why did you even recommend that? I want the price to go up so I can sell it. <laughs> wow no i didn't you know you know me better than that that's a good game seriously fight but yeah so yeah they can jump jump in discord that's the best way to do it but there is there is the other options of, of the dms and bits and pieces so. the bits and pieces they've all fallen the by the wayside pieces. haven't they let's face yeah, fact. Get discord so this week mm-hmm. we attended wasd live stroke london games fest but it, it it was bittersweet because at the same time uh we had this little bit of info the news that e3 2023 has been cancelled is, is literally only a few days old at this point and we're honestly kind of still reeling sure we knew that the venerable industry event had an uphill battle ahead of it with publishers pulling out left and right but it still seems kind of surreal uh in an interview with gamesindustry.biz entertainment software association esa Executive Director Stanley Pierre-Louis explains what happened and what we can expect next. For the first in-person event in several years, the ESCA partnered with event coordinator Reed Pop, and Pierre-Louis explains that we were off to a strong start. There was interest among exhibitors, industry players, media, and certainly the fans. Ultimately, however, there were challenges that proved too large to surmount. One of these insurmountable challenges was the current development timelines studios have been facing since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and another is a result of economical turbulence businesses have faced the world over with less money to go around some companies have begun to rethink investing in expensive booth space and massive marketing events on the subject of e3 returning in 2024 pierre louis sticks to the script stating that we're committed to providing an industry platform for marketing and convening but we want to make sure we find the right balance makes the needs of the industry we certainly need we're certainly going to be listening and ensuring whatever we want to offer meets those needs and at that time we will have more news to share his answer is completely non-committal, as you might expect. For our two cents, we certainly suggest it seems like the era of E3 is over. Uh, with so many cheaper and more effective ways mm. of getting the word out about upcoming games and projects, not to mention public hesitance following a devastating pandemic. The writing has been on the wall for some time now. We just hope uh, other manufacturers are saving themselves for their showcases or their mm. directs or however way they're engaging with people now via the medium of the internet that was introduced during COVID, it kind of broke the addiction to the physical events and certainly set people up for having their announcements delivered to them on a, well, for the vast majority of the gaming public, only ever could watch the news come out of E3 on the laptop or phone screens or whatever screen it is they're using. But that certainly severed that addiction to the E3, 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 everyone's got a hype up, show something, whether they're ready or not. If you go to E3 and you don't show, it means you've got nothing. If you do and you show and it's slightly broken or early, you're you're liable to getting ripped apart for it. The direct industry events that they've got going on at the moment allows them to do like a very roadmapped, clear, concise, cut video that showcases the very best of the games in an elevator pitch style without allowing mm. people hands-on or make an embarrassment of yourself on the stage when your game crashes or you fall through the floor. Equally so, that was part of the joy, and it let us know, well, it is real. Mm. You know, it is working. It's not just a cut scene. It's not just a render. It, it, mm. It's actually solid. It, it's, it's happening. Um, and then, obviously, industry insiders go behind the back scenes, backstage, behind the scenes, and they get to play the games, and then they get to come back, write a, like a, write a preview in a magazine, as was back in the day, or write a preview for a website, and build the momentum for the game independently from the publishers, the producers themselves. We, the industry now sort of finds itself in this sort of in-between place. Is this a place, putting your game ahead on, take your podcast head off for a moment, put your game ahead on, is E3 missed or have we found 
we're getting on better with these showcase events instead? Um, I think with me, I think there's, there's three main things for me. Um, I think because of COVID, like you mentioned, COVID, I think uh, the main, you know, I think Sony were one of the first ones to draw, pull themselves away from E3. But I think yeah. with COVID, with doing things online and they've started, you know, they've studied the financial data and thought, hang on, things are still selling as well. And I read a report the other day, I think it was, I think the last E3 Sony went to it cost them a million dollars just to set the stage up, to get there and set the stage up. Mm. And I would imagine that's nowhere near that to put a, to put a state of play together. No. And I think they've they've realised that you don't have to be at E three to sell the games to people. I think another point is, um, gamers are changing. We all know that. Me and you are dinosaurs in the gamer world now. We like our physical copies. We buy our physical copies. We do digital sometimes, but mostly we buy physical. The gamer absorbs the information now digitally and i think most of the gamers the younger gamers coming through now would they go to e3 or would they rather watch an xbox showcase state of play nintendo direct i'm likely thinking that they'd rather watch it on youtube and and see what's coming out done you know and also like you say i think it is down to the changing world in budgets as well yes there's a bit of an uh, you know, recession on at the moment, and these companies are looking at ways of cutting costs. And if it is costing that amount, but a stage on E3 where you're going to go there for a few days, share a few games, which you could still hit that same audience with by doing a, a showcase or a state of play online, I would imagine they're probably going to go with the online. I think there was something, if I try and put my head on, obviously E3 predates what I would call general accessibility to the internet. Mm. And therefore, it was a good time for magazines to go gather information, put together like an E3 special and put that out information at wholesale while getting behind titles they thought were worth getting behind. It was great. You know, and that worked in that era. I think now, obviously, in the advent of YouTube and all that sort of stuff, I think the companies were looking for a reason to back out. Obviously, prior to COVID, if you backed out, you look like in the old school playground fights of uh, the gaming, if you were an E3, whatever brand or publishing house or console manufacturer, PC manufacturer, whatever it is, didn't attend, well, that would leave you wide open to a kick in, A, in the gaming press. Yeah, that's as though you separated yourself. As a gamer in the playground on the old message boards back in the day, MSN message boards, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you were going to have to, as a fan of that system or publishing house, you were going to have to suit up in your armour and go out and defend said brand. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think that obviously COVID came along, perfect excuse, we don't need to do it. Okay, we're going to do a digital version as a nice treat for them because they're stuck in their houses. Boom, that went over. Well, that worked. As mm -hmm. you say, compared to a stand, um, insignificant cost of the people to run the stand, their hotel bills, the fi the food that you need to give them, the food that you need to give the people yeah. that you bring on, the backstage area and out of out of daytime events. You all have to put nighttime events on as well to mm -hmm. throw booze at the press, to to give people a reason to go. You've got the booth girls, you've got all of it, you know, all mm -hmm. of that point of sale material that's, that's involved in the stand, but then there's also the advertising outside, the commitment to E3, to build up the show independently of them as well. Mm. A million pounds, I think, is a rather conservative estimate. I know mm. it's just a figure pulled out of the air, but that can mm. very quickly get eviscerated. Yeah. Um, so, And yeah. also, I mean, if, if, if you're doing a state of play or, you know, Nintendo Direct, you're likely hitting a lot bigger audience to what you are at E3. I and know, directly the audience. Exactly. And I know at E3... Um, you know, you would get the, it would be broadcast as well, but you're not you you're getting into a wide range, like you say, you're getting a wide range of gamers. But if you're doing a state of play, who's going to watch a state of play? The PlayStation gamers. Who's going to watch Xbox Showcase? The ex what? you know, you're hitting your your audience direct. Question: Pre COVID, yeah. early days, early to the high days of E3, mm -hmm. did it almost make like a two tier experience as well? Because you're the gamer. You get to watch a trailer. You're in the industry. You've flown out to LA. 
it almost put like this prestige on it that mm. made it feel walled off to the to everyday people yeah. that you know can't go to E3, they can't go to LA, so they're making the best of it. They're watching the videos and the live streams as they come out. Now, the press are getting the information at the very same time mm. as average Joe blogs on 23 Acacia Avenue in uh, Wickstead in Hampshire. Mm. Is that that's slightly more universal, isn't it? It's mm. slightly more like we value all of you. And yeah. I, But then again, at the same time, I feel like if you then go on to an independent games website, you're just looking for their, much like we give our opinion on things, it's then your investment in that individual person's opinion mm. rather than the maybe the facts and figures coming out as it is. Mm. Or is that, is that no, journalism? Yeah, and I also think now that the, the the game and press and where these companies, your Sony's, your Microsoft's, your Nintendo's, your, your, your PC development companies as well, the press... I, I don't mean to sound horrible. I think the, the game and press are slightly less more significant now. It's your streamers and your early access people. They're the ones with the audience. You know, these people are superstars online, the YouTubers, the, the streamers. They're playing them early. Their opinion is where what sells the games nowadays. It's you weird, know? but it's true, isn't and, it? And it's changing. It's changing. It's gone away. You know, when 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 we were younger, it was gaming magazines. Thing is, what you worries me? The gospel of those gaming. I know magazines. that gaming journalists probably by default are meant to be independent, but um, can a person ever be truly independent in their mindset and thoughts? Mm. And the same, but a journalist, for the most part, even in gaming journalism, has been through several rounds of having their work critiqued. Is this mm. is this independent enough? Does this cover off all of this enough? Does mm. the review score that you've given it actually reflect the game let's critique it i'm an editor i'm not an editor but i'm the editor of a, a gaming magazine i'm going to read your submission go through mark it send it back to you to rewrite and send back to me to make sure it covers it in the most sync way possible mm. i'm a tube streamer right i'm a hot tub tube streamer i'm lent over the side of a hot tub on a cold winter's night, lit up by neon RGB colours, mm. saying how great this game is, whose opinion's worth more? Although one gets more views and one gets more coverage, yeah. who do we trust? And are we guilty of eroding traditional games journalism down to the point of like, well, XYZ on Twitch said this was amazing. They had early access and... I can't remember some of her points, but at least remember a couple of her points about this game. It mm. must be great. I don't know as that's, or does it matter now? Does it just is it just about I think getting it out there? I think regardless I mean, of where it goes. Yeah, I think coverage, the maximum amount of coverage is what they'll do. So you'll you know, you look at companies like Eurogame or IGN, they do their online journalism. You can read, you can read their. The, their, um, what they think of games, but they also they'll stream games. They'll also have streamers. They'll also, you know, so they're they're sitting on the fence of both sides. I think it comes down. I know I keep saying this. It comes down to an age thing. Me and you, if there's a new game coming out, we would probably hit up a Push Square. We would probably hit up a IGN, see what they think. Now, my daughter, what would she look at? She'd probably go to her favourite streamer see them playing it, see what they think. So I think it's more, we're a bit more traditional going over to that streaming side, whereas I there is no way my daughter would look up a game and read a report on IGN of a game. Mm. It would be, you know, they 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 consume their games and their new games coming out by, by streamers playing them. It's, you know, it's Twitch and YouTube all the way. Scary. Okay. Is, well, yeah. That's, that's E3 lamented. I think we we both knelt down and threw some soil on its coffin. Um, <laughs> it's sad. Yeah. It's nice while it lasted. You know, it brought us some great moments, and it, it, it's launched all the generations of console kind of really up to PS4. Mm. After that, we went in. We disappeared into the ether. Uh, something that did disappear into the ether, though. WASD Live, uh, and and obviously PAX occurred at the same time. And Seb will be back next week, uh, mm -hmm. or, or whenever we next formulate an episode. 
and we'll we'll dig into the behind the scenes stuff that he's got for us from that. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we went to London Games Fest. Um, give me a takeaway from that. It was good. It was an experience. Um, I found it not frustrating, but in, in sometimes, like I think the issue we had, you'd have four screens set up, for instance, in an area. You'd have four indie games on there. All look good, right? But the devs weren't there. You know, they might be from all around the world, which is understandable. It's expensive to travel, come all the way to London. And you'd have a you'd have one, two, maybe three people as a marketing company running those. Mm. Now the issue I have with that is if that's the case, they literally needed a laminated A4 for a piece of paper on each one to say what the game is, what style it is, what platforms they're hoping to come out on, um, and a little you know synopsis of the game just quickly written on there so we can read. There wasn't any of that. You had these marketing people, um, which there was that distance from it. So the questions you'd or we would want to ask, you're not necessarily going to get the answers to unless you speak to the developers. Mm. who weren't actually there so that was that was that sort of mix so you had to sort of go in blind on these games to think well what actually is this is this a you know strategy game is this a platformer what is it where you know where did they get the idea for this game from how long have they been developing it for where are they based there was none of that information no it was sad it it was a bit for me hit and miss i don't want to i don't want to you know hit down on the place you know yeah thank you for inviting us to be your asd life (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> you know, it was it was good experience, but that I found a bit frustrating. But it wasn't just from indie people. I mean, there was bigger game companies there. Um, but I found out a bit of a similar thing. Me and you, we went and had a play on Undisputed, the new boxing game that's coming out. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought graphically very good. They had people's likenesses and their little traits, and I thought that was good. The gameplay was good. It, you yeah, had to be quite tactical. Really enjoyed that. But same again, four screen setup. You can just wander up and play. They had one of those fairground punch bags where you get your score next to it. And the people who are running the stand were more interested in getting people to do it on the punch bag. There wasn't really anyone to chat about the game or the I, I or, feel uh, having attended some of these events on both sides of the fence, not within the game industry, but across of other industries, I found that I just felt like the stands it's okay to have people there bringing the game up, but you run an event before the event to get the people in that are going to be at the event showcasing your game and you teach them everything about it to make sure that on the day yeah. they can be as passionate as you are or the, the actual key developer is about the game. Yeah. Now, Undisputed is a great example. That was a marketing company's obviously produced the bannerage. They've obviously yeah. worked to get the games there. Um, I don't even think they they, I think WSD Live supplied the keyboards and the mouse and the gaming controllers and the screens, and mm. they just had to supply the people and the game and make sure that worked. Now, I think that's your key words there. Sorry to interrupt. I think the people more than likely were trained to be there to make sure the machines ran properly. Not, I, I think in Undisputed, game. they had people there that were engaged primarily for bringing people to the stand. Now, I think that they probably didn't know enough about gaming as a full stop. This is not everybody's stand is guilty of this, but they probably didn't know enough about the game. They'd been hired by an events company to come and stand on a show. Like last week they were doing Pedigree Chum, this week they're doing Undisputed. Okay. Mm. So if there's a, a thing that distracts people and can gather people to the stand, then it's easier to stand around that and pass your day between nine and five so you get paid. You're going to gravitate towards getting people on the punching game. Mm. Yeah. Instead of getting people sat down, like, oh, what's your name? You know, there was no data capture. Yeah. And there I was think no, like, me, where I are think... you from? What's yeah. your story? What do you want to extract from your play? quick play of this game? Okay, right. Okay, here's a here's a press pack or here's some contact details if you want to uh, get a code or you want to talk about this on air. If you want to get a bit more information, mm. we can email you. I'm, I'm not even looking for a press pack. I'm looking for just some email details about the game and, mm. and, and maybe some – quick words from the developer themselves that you could use as a soundbite or you could glean mm. a little bit more information from. Yeah. There were obviously 
Um, obviously, we spoke to the show's own Zorro Arts, who's in the yeah. Discord. He's producing. And that was probably the, the best chat we had all day. It was really wonderful. He was passionate. He was involved. You know, he talked about his aspirations for the game. And um, we're hoping to have him on because German listeners, yeah. he's from Germany. So we've we've recognised the huge spike in listeners in Germany. And we're going to bring on a, a native speaker as well uh, for an interview about his game and what it's like to be an independent and, developer. Yeah. And that's anyway. exactly what we mean by talking to the developer. We've now got him coming on the show. We had a good chat about how he came up with the game, what he's planning to do next. He struggles with trying to get it published. If you've got a marketing team in, you're not going to get that. And the, and, and the, and the sad thing is, me playing Undisputed got me pumped for that game. I haven't played a good boxing game for a long while. It got me pumped, but I'm not talking about me being pumped for the game. I'm talking about the lack of information or people I had to talk about the game, if that makes sense. Mm. you know. And that's a shame, really, with talking about it in the wrong light. But with, with Zorro Arts, he was there, he was with his game. He'd flew over from Germany. And we had a great chat with him. We'd done some networking with him. It was fantastic. And that's what I'd, I'd, I'd like to see more of. I know it's not always possible, you know, these some of these indie Thing developers. Is, the conversation you know, that we expensive. had the conversation we had with him, and he's highlighted certain key parts of the game that were just scrolling by on a screen, really. Yeah. Then when you had his almost director's commentary behind it, it added another granularity to the story. And you're like, Yeah, actually, do you know I yeah. can see this now? I kind of what's with the art style, and obviously it explains and says, you know, his history with gaming in general and the influences mm. that's given him you know, playing Wind Waker and all these other things is actually yep. really his personal gaming story gets boiled down into this, his own creation. Yeah. You know, it was the sum of all of its parts, but you wouldn't normally take that away. Obviously, some of the Metroidvania style of that game was was obvious in its packaging, yeah. but some of the more nuanced stuff that he mentioned would, would be completely lost uh, yeah. without him being there. And I know a press pack can't do that or a, a link to a website that gives you the blurb about the game. It can sort of do that. But to engage yeah. one-on-one like that was really what I wanted. Mm. Now, there obviously were lots of people kicking around. We saw the PlayStation Access people. Um, we saw other people from and in and around the sort of gaming creator side mm-hmm. of things. I think we saw Retro Faith and, uh, mm. and others there. It's It seemed like people wanted it to be what we wanted it to be, but yeah. it wasn't quite that. And, you know, I want to build excitement for these games. I want to see, there was one in particular, Movie House. I think it's in Ray's boot this yeah. week and we saw it. And as soon as I saw it, you know, the guy was covering five games, all massively different. Mm-hmm. He had been brought in to host the um, section where people could, developers could join remotely and talk to you while you're playing the game that Mm. for the most part works great but i guess some of these developers were busy maybe they're having a cup of tea (laughs) maybe Mm. it was a different time zone for them so being online Mm. all the time wasn't really that easy and the guy was doing his best to be engaging across a range one of the stands on that stand had about six games running through on a highlight reel so this guy's trying to cover off and remember 15 games yeah. in depth so people like you and me can come along and speak to him about that now he was engaging he was an interesting uh yeah, chat very good that networking and streaming company but that's that's the issue there what were we talking to him about we were talking about his net the company he works for the network well that's what company. he knows about yeah we weren't talking about the the, the games that are on the screen now i've been waiting point. years for a sequel a, a spiritual sequel to the movies by um Lionhead or Bullfrog, mm. whichever it was at the time. Uh, fun, I and I loved that game back in the day and mm. wish for another revisit. It kind of got dropped too early and this was it. And I want to get excited about it, but I'm kind of struggling to, apart from what I've seen. Mm. So, yeah, what was some of the standout? Obviously, Undisputed, you've talked about. We talk about uh, Macus Adventure as well with Zorro Arts. What else mm. is there? there that grabbed your fancy um i was more there was quite a few of the little indie games i thought were quite good um you can really see people's talents really and how artistic they are because i mean for instance i know i'm going back to zara arts again but Macus adventure i mean this guy's done this on his own he's 20 years his own 20 he's 20 years old and and 
I'm not just saying it because he's coming on the show. That is one of the best games I saw there. Graphically stunning for what he's done. The light and the parallax scrolling. I mean, you think this is a big studio done this. I mean, some big studios have tried going back to this 2D Castlevanias and they look nowhere near as good as what he's done. So there's some serious talent out there. But I found the bigger studios were more um, either trying to sell you merch, stand and have a cuddle with a big... <laughs> with a big plush toy, you know. But, a push was, penis. Let's be yeah. correct here. Yeah. Yes. You know, so they were going around, you can have your pictures taken with them. It was more of a brand exercise rather than come and play our game. Mm. One thing that disappointed me is PSVR 2 just out. It's It should be on the tip of everyone's lips, really. And PlayStation rocked up with a VR 2 stand, showcasing, in my humble opinion, completely the wrong games yes um and it was st- again it felt like a stand that's done a lap of the uk like it's been in meadow wall it's been in the metro center it's been in london's trocadero center it's like an experience area mm. but these people again were slightly higher caliber but certainly just event staff next week they'll be doing i don't know an utterly butterly taste test in bournemouth uh this week they're doing psvr well- to me, that PSVR stand seemed as though it wasn't. I know it was PlayStation, but it didn't even seem it was done by PlayStation. It looked like one of one of them where people had actually purchased PSVRs and and were just going around getting people to play. And, it didn't seem yeah. as though it, it and was, the game selection was, was odd. odd. Very where odd. was Call of the Mountain? If they're going to do, if they're not going to hype anything in the future, fair enough. But if, why don't you hype what you've got? Why was yeah. why didn't they buy a kayak? Throw it down on the floor, get you in the kayak, put the headset on. That would have been transformative. Yeah. That would have been one of those moments. It could have had it sat up on some rocks. Yeah. What? Why am I capable of thinking of these point of sale stands or demonstration or intro stands, and they don't? I mean, if you're going to do a game mm. that's going to blow away people f- that are familiar with the brand and aren't, give them a completely middle of the road, non branded experience in kayak VR again. I don't want to rave about that game. I'm not getting paid, but probably the best experience on PSVR 2 right now. Mm. And instead we got what I would call just slip, slap and silly games. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. It seemed as though a lot of the big companies were selling the brand, not not the games and the hardware themselves. It was, you know, their names were everywhere, but they weren't. I mean, I don't, again, it could have gone on Instagram very quickly and found a UK cosplayer that does a half a decent Aloy and got them down. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're bang on. Absolutely. Cost you, what, a train ticket? A ticket for some food, some merch? Really? Cosplayers are just excitable fans like you or I, you know, Mm -hmm. book a day off holiday, come down and have a go. You know, and you could have them wandering around. Come and have a go on a PSVR 2. Come and have a go on Kayak. Be cool, wouldn't it? You know, you probably wouldn't normally want to play a Kayak game, but try this. Are so immersive coming on, but there was get, no one get doing the that. UK Olympic kayak champion to come down, yeah. The Eddie the Eagle Edwards of kayaking to sit <laughs> there and tell people how realistic it is. No, you're right, yeah. It was, it's, it was strange, it was strange, you know. And like I say, the best things I can take from it was talking to the developers themselves, but there wasn't many of them there from what I could see. Hmm, okay. So my standout game was probably, obviously, apart from Macca's Adventure, which sounds a bit egregious because we're having him on and he's in the Discord. And mm. if you're listening now and you're developing a game, get in the Discord. We want to speak to you. We want to help yeah. you push the game. We want to help you talk about it. We want to raise the just the heat on the game generally to yeah. attract people's I mean, attention to it. Upload. You can upload your screenshots, you know, show, show your your workings on it, how it's going. You yeah, know, take, you're take. going to do a beta, tell us where the beta is. You know, we've got plenty of people in there from all different tastes of games. I, I would say even just to have like a developer diary where you take people on a journey from zero to a game being published on there. Fantastic within, idea. Yeah. yeah within Fantastic the, idea. Um, you, you know, we let, we allow people to drop links and push their own items. You know, mm. Traditionally, you know, people have pushed their radio shows, podcasts, other bits, but mm. to have a developer on pushing a game and giving us a developer journey would be incredible. And yep. I think probably maybe could be a strong arm of this show. I don't suppose we can 
get out of this without my ritualistic embarrassment of myself and an industry-leading lifetime award-winning BAFTA winner, Shuya Yoshida. It's funny when you see people that you've kind of admired your whole life in real life, in person sometimes, and it, it, it sort of descends into what I would call like a fever dream very quickly. <laughs> and when I saw Shuhei, I kind of, I looked to you, I panicked. I reached into my pocket for a grubby looking UCP card <laughs> that at that point had been badly managed. My pocket management was bad and it, it was, it had come out looking like management. a piece of corrugated iron. Uh, you said you can't, if you're thinking of giving him something, don't give him that. No. Give him this immaculate yeah. UCP card. With proper pocket management. With proper pocket management. <laughs> you brought a bag. I was, un- I was unprepared. I brought a Tesco shopping bag. And not even a full life version either. I'm talking a homeless man special pulled out of a book <laughs> on the way to WASD Live. <laughs> <laughs> Smell a little bit of tenant super strength, if I'm honest. Uh, I he was he was hot off winning a BAFTA, uh, yeah. an industry recognised award, not just within gaming but film mm. and television. Mm. Some absolute mm. beer moths of entertainment themselves have won this. I'm talking yeah. multiple Oscar award winners. I'm talking English Illuminati, as far as the filming industry is concerned. Mm. One would call him a god. Yet why me, an ant, decided to approach him? Now, at this point, I approached his space. Danger, danger. And the look of panic in his eyes was was strong. In a bid to keep me away, he offered his hand in friendship, a a traditional European handshake. Mm. But unfortunately, I had the card in my fingers, so it created this awkward moment of me having to remove the card shake his hand but it, i normally pride myself on giving a strong handshake rgt it's it's the kind of mm. moniker of a man um. i basically presented him a piece of wet moldy lettuce and i could feel the revulsion in his fingers as they <laughs> across this lifeless piece of vegetable matter which is my hand. <laughs> i looked up <laughs> And in his eyes was nothing but bitter disappointment. He's quite a diminutive character. He's quite yeah. short. And I mm. kind of towered above him in a way. And he looked up to me, not in the way that a child would look up to a man, but in a way that looked like, what are you? Yeah. Who what is, is this? I was, I was gently just looking at the security guys as he just moved his blazer to one side, gently unclipped the taser. I'm glad I didn't see that. To, ready to bring this... Well, there was, a point, there was a point where my embarrassment maxed out. At that point, I took the aforementioned card, thrust it in his hand, closed his palm around it, <laughs> looked to you, and made my escape. I didn't look back, but one would imagine that card was thrown down into a Pyrex dish and his security staff just torched it. He might, be, he might be listening now. He's always been dipping in and dipping out of the show. So apologies. In my you. mind, he's yeah. I would like to arrange a point in time where I can apologize. And I I am not I'm all joking aside, I would genuinely get on a, a streaming video with him and I would just bow for 10 minutes solid in a proper genuine Japanese display of a, apologetic behavior i would just be like that was a private moment for you you were looking at vampire survivors probably thinking shoe hayes here do you know what let's sweep under the carpet let's get this on playstation that moment was ruined by a an uncouth lincolnshire man whose desperate need to thrust a piece of three inch by two inch card in his hand overrode the whole of his event (laughs) but only is probably scoop of finally getting vampire survivors on playstation not only was he talking to their Mano a Mano BAFTA award winner to BAFTA award winner, and then this creature appears, Gollum like. <laughs> <laughs> and what did we discuss? That would have been funny. You were saying, Did you get a picture? Did you get a picture? And I was like, Was that it happened so quick? No, but it that would have been quite amusing. If the thing actually, is, it happened so quick. Time, you... Yeah, by the time I took the picture, it was just the frozen moment in time of little George. Having fifty thousand volts shoved for him from a security guard, <laughs> 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 on the floor. Well, Shuhei yeah. himself just 
in a self-defense, a very basic self-defense lesson, which I probably would have no answer to, getting my arm up behind my back and karate chopping is probably the wrong term. Just generally karate, no, just just gen, just gen, beating me off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. Um. Anyway, we, we'll move on from that. So anyway, WSD Live, it was nice to finally be invited to an event. I don't think after our berating of it, we'll probably be allowed to go again. But there yeah. were some great takeaways. You know, there were some games that piqued our interest, and we'll talk about those as the, as the weeks and months unfold. Um, and, you know, for the most part, it felt cool, but just wanted more behind the scenes and not i don't mean backstage and being given champagne i don't care no, for any of no. that I'm, I'm, i what think we... we mentioned as well because you know obviously we, we were invited we had we had the press passes so you could go into the press area which just seemed to be somewhere to eat your lunch whereas that would have been nice basically to have few... we, we took our burger in there and on yeah. the table next to us and no disrespect okay because it was expensive in there but the guy next to us reached into his bag and pulled out a tupperware and there's yeah. his sandwiches there yeah. while staring into space yeah well you think that was quite a big area there and it would have been quite nice to have that as a meeting place so when you went up to these stages you went up to the stands you went up to the indie games you went up to the big triple a developers and said can we go in a press area? We'll have a little bit of a chat. I've got a few questions to ask you. Yep, yep, you've got 20 minutes of me time. And, Even and if it was two good. minutes. Two minutes, yeah, exactly. Two minutes, I'm probably being a bit much for 20. But, you know, just somewhere you can get quietly out of the way and have your chats. That would have been a perfect area for that. But it didn't really, that might have been what it was for, but it didn't really seem to be. Well, there was no one to take to the press area, was there? That's the no. thing. No, they were just, yeah, they're just the people who were looking after the stands, really, you know. Um. So yeah, yeah, shame on that front. But no, that was yeah, that was nice to be invited. It was good to go. It was a good experience, um, and it was good to see some news. Like I say, the indie games really grabbed me, and yeah, and I was impressed with Undisputed. I'd like to see, I'd like to see some more of that, and I'd like to you know have a chat with people more about that in, involved with it. If, yeah, if I, what I liked about that was the way that the camera was just a really great distance. The you know yeah. we were only playing in like a boxing club, but you know the interactivity and the way the light fell across the individuals there looked mm. and felt great. And yeah, you know took a little bit of time getting used to. If you you know like me, you you probably last boxing game you played was fight night. Uh, that allowed you to go a little bit hell for leather at times, whereas this one was more of a a very long term, very slow burn boxing game, especially at the mm. weights we had been selected on in the demo to play out, which was more medium, you know, middle mm. to heavyweight, super heavyweight style. They are a lot more slow paced yeah. and methodical matches, but yeah, it is what it is. Um, looking forward to to doing something like that again, and obviously we've got packs to talk about with uh, Seb next episode and um yeah looking forward to welcoming uh, Zoro Arts on for a talk mm, about Max Adventure and the general troubles of being a, a, a modern indie developer which I think yeah. would be which would be wonderful. Mm. Now with all that said and done, mm -hmm. obviously someone hanging around the back of uh, WADC WASD live and and probably more likely PAX was the Ray filling his boot with bountiful supplies of new and hot things. Um, should we get him in? Yeah. It's time for a peek in what we affectionately call Stingray's boot whilst that's between some counterfeit nappies and a dodgy copy of Battlefriend all this week. These are the new release highlights for the week April 3rd to April 9th. Listen as these are out in digital physical or will be by the time this in your feed, but could be, I'm not even joking here, could be region dependent. Spring stop, wow, whoa. Now, he didn't go to WA SD Live, Ode Ray. He went to PAX like a player. Now I don't I don't know if Seb saw him there. We'll never know. It would have been interesting to find out. But for some reason he's embraced the Hollywood lifestyle. And I see him coming out dressed in a a dark red robe, mm -hmm. looking a little bit like Hugh Hefner, if I'm honest. And the scary thing is. This week, I'm seeing his son, Wayne. As a playboy bunny. Now, the unfortunate side effect of that is. 
to me, the danger sign of him looking like Hugh Hefner is, I feel like Stingray's got addicted to Viagra. The sad thing is, I don't think anyone's taking it harder than me and Wayne. Okay. How are you seeing him this week? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, with my new love of boxing games, he's come in like a slightly beraggled Rocky. He's got the big baggy shorts on. He's got the gloves. He's even tied the mullet back into a ponytail just to keep it out of his way while he's jabbing. And Wayne has come as little Mickey, the coach, <laughs> in a little track suit. He's got a little gruff voice like that. And he's coaching him just as he's Wayne's skipping up the drive. <laughs> you know, yeah, phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> to the games Creed Rise to Glory Championship Editions get in a PS2 release box of- this has got to be your mummy mummy hasn't it yeah. April 4th you are Adonis Creed fighting toe to toe with the world's top opponents to establish your boxing legacy this intense cinematic experience features new phantom melee technology for impactful VR melee combat so you can train fight and win I can't help thinking with that though. Someone is gonna, there's someone's gonna roundhouse the TV screen, aren't they? They're gonna do oh. a full punch straight through a plasma. I might download like this, <laughs> and then you're gonna say, "Oh, RGT, I smash the telly up. <laughs> when I do an uppercut, <laughs> I put the end for the Sony." <laughs> oh, don't, don't get, oh. get save us from what's right now. Podcast suicide. Bring me the next game out of the boot. Filthy animals. Is the next one. Remember that? What's that off? Home Alone. Filthy, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah. Filthy animals. Heist simulator PC April 4th. We had, filthy animals is a chaotic multi- No, not that. Fil- he's Ray's also got underneath the back left front seat a copy of Filthy Animals. Yeah, that's just just get the heist simulator. Yeah. 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 yeah I can quite imagine. Um, it's chaotic multiplayer heist game for one to four players. Become a mutant animal working for a criminal mastermind, Tony, as you steal, fight, fall over, and eat tacos while trying to make off with the loot. Solve puzzles, avoid enemies, and bumble your way to victory, you filthy animal. <laughs> Sorry, I've had too much coffee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look in here, Ray. Grim Grim Gamori once more. PS5, PS4 on Switch, April 4th. The classic strategy RPG is back with a whole new look. Grim Grim Gamore once more. It's a remaster of the original Grim Grim Gamore, featuring the fantastical world building and intricate storytelling Vanilla Ware is known for, as well as real time tactical gameplay with improved mechanics. Now, that's my periphery, Mummy Mummy. I've got it on PS2. It's a great mm. game. I implore everyone to pick it up because it's. Uh, probably better than Hogwarts Legacy, and that's basically what it is. Uh, really? Yeah. Never you, played it. Yeah. Played it. It's been a while, but you play like a witch in like a witch school, and then you journey through that. Really? Yeah, within a... Don't get me wrong, <laughs> Hogwarts Legacy is probably a little bit more to everyone's taste, but this is mm. certainly Vinan Aware's take on a sorcery school, which mm. uh, is actually pretty cool. So, yeah. Mm, What's next? Gosh. Meet your maker, PC, PS5, Xbox Series X, PS4, and Xbone, April 4th. What? This is all in capitals. Any reason? Have I got a shout at all? That's the developer. Their blurb to me was all okay. in capitals. So I try and uh, match their spirit with I don't know my if I've got spirit. to be aggressive or... Try it. Yeah. Meet your maker is a first-person game where every level is designed by players for players. Also going to be April's uh, PS Premium game. Yeah. There's that Sackboy's Adventure, which I feel like I've been given more times by Sony than I've had the clap. <laughs> and I uh, back round, did it? Sackboy's yeah, Adventure. I can't remember what the other one was. Uh, it was a game where you play as a, a mouse, 2D side-scrolling RPG. Uh, we'll come back to that. 
Iron Heart or something from memory. No, yes, yeah, yeah. I don't know what something mean. like that. Messaging yeah. community corrections, tell me what I've got wrong, but there's your heads up on the, the early release of the games. Yeah. Uh, Movie House coming out on the PC. This is one we saw at WSD Live and one that captured my attention uh, very greatly. As I say, it's a spiritual, in the words of the developer, it's a sp- spiritual success. It's a mo- the movies game from back in the day. Welcome to the big show. It's ready the camera, unleash your creativity and create the flicks you've always dreamed of. Grow your operation with Razor Shop Business Sense and usher in a new era for filmmakers worldwide. Bring it to console, bring it to console, bring it to console. If ever there was a reason for me to go out and spend 500 bucks on a Steam Deck so I could play one game, it's Movie House. Mm. That's my mummy mummy. So uh, everyone get behind it it and pump it. (laughs) What's next? Next is Batora Lost Heaven Switch, April 6th. Batora Lost Heaven is a choice-driven isometric action-adventure RPG. God, that is a description. One hell of a description. Yeah, with RPG elements and a unique duality system affecting combat, story, dialogues, puzzles and endings that will make you question the meaning of sacrifice. Wow. Mm, straight Ooh. up curse of the sea rats pc ps4 xbox one switch april 6 embark on an epic handmated ratoidvania adventure where your crew has been turned into rats by pirate witch just a normal day at work explore a rich non-linear <laughs> world enjoy fun action platforming face challenging bosses and unlock unique abilities either alone or in local co-op hmm Raven's Watch PC, April 6th. Fallen heroes of old folk tales and legends, you are on the verge of a crucial battle against nightmare, invading and corrupting your world. A roguelike? Ray, you've got another roguelike. You promised me there'd be no more roguelikes. I'm sick of it. Don't wave your red velvety gown at me, you diva. (laughs) That's your son. I don't care how I'm seeing it. Pack it in. A roguelike action game from the creators of Curse of the Dead Gods, playable solo or in online co-op. Mm, okay. Mm. Which one's your mummy mummy? Um, I am torn between Creed Rise to Glory or Filthy Animals. I think, you know, I'm going to go Filthy Animals. Keeping it, keeping it mm. real. Okay. PC mm. title for both of us. Mm. Interesting. What's your VHS mummy mummy pick? Fancy horror this week. So I'm going for Damien, the Omen. Okay. I'm going for it, yeah. I don't know if I've had this before, but I'm going to pick Overboard with Kurt Russell and Goldie Horn. The story of, I think it's a remake of a, an older film, but it's actually an 80s yeah. story of how she's a, a rich sort of trophy wife on a yacht who falls in the water and then loses her memory and Kurt Russell claims her as his own wife and helps gets her with her amnesia. You to... know when they met in real life on there? It might have been. And then was. she helps him raise his runaway uh bereaved children after his wife had passed. So it sounds pretty deep and meaningful, but it's actually a runaway 80s comedy, mm. which is uh, hilarious in a way that only 80s comedies can be. So, yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful movie. With that, me clutching a copy of Overboard in one hand, a PC code for the movies in the other, I look down and all I see on the floor is a singular blue pill. I'm not going to touch that, to be honest. Uh, it's not. No, he likes to leave a calling card. This time it's a... Probably a herbal tablet, if I'm honest with you. Uh, RGT, everyone knows that once the ray goes, and leaves mm-hmm. behind his token spiritual signature mm-hmm. for that week. Um, it's time for me to ask you what you're hoping to play. Um, I'll probably just mop up that last part of Hogwarts, even though story's done. I just want to do that, see what that's like. The I keep probably saying this wrong. I think it's the House Cup. Is it the House Cup? Hogwarts House Cup, whatever, just to... Just a year off. That'll do. People know what I mean. Yeah. Um, probably play some more Live Alive. Um, join that little sort of in deep space um, one I'm playing at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting stuck back into that. And if um, I get time, because we are quite busy getting prepared for OLL 23, 
Um, I will maybe start the Mass Effect that I've been threatening to for ages. So the Legendary Edition, I've got that downloaded, ready to go. Me too. Talking, of, talking about OLL23 as well. Well done to Sims3350 and Zach Man. They were both winners on our live draw we've done on Instagram. And they both got a pair of tickets to OLL23. So well done, guys, and look forward to well seeing you Well done, there. guys. Can't wait mm. to meet you in person. Thank you for yep. joining the Discord. Thanks to everyone who got involved. Um, yep. It's wonderful to see you all there. A lot of people, obviously, if, you, if you've already bought tickets, you probably didn't want to leave it to this point um, and hope to win them. So thank you to everyone that's actually yep. bought a ticket Definitely. that's coming to support us, I suppose, in a way. We owe you our very much our, uh, our thanks and we're very warmed, heart warmed by that. And thank you very yep. much for, for supporting us. If you're still on the fence, well, get off of it. Get some splinters in that backside, friend. Jump down on the side of OLL. Go grab yourself some tickets. If you're in and around the local area, it's a no-brainer. What else are you going to do? Nothing. Okay, yeah. so come and see us. Support the show. Um, got a range of bits of merch there, some giveaways and some other bits and bobs for you to get stuck into. Uh, we'll, we'll, we will try technology dependent to record an episode there it might not be as interactive as we hoped so well Ella's warned us that there's issues with the internet uh noise control it's in a big hall but we will do our best we'll be out Mm -hmm. and around on the bazaars looking at other people's stands no doubt remortgaging our homes and buying a copy of some (laughs) snes game that we we thought we'd never see in the flesh uh, and then did um you know who needs who needs to feed their children anyway? Games, games, games. I'm expecting you to go off, look at the games, and when you come back, you need to have Cursed Mountain. Oh my creatures, wing arms, <laughs> all your holiday wars, Starflight. I've got them on GT, I've got them, I've got the lot. Got them all, got the full set, deadly yeah. creatures. I've even got a t-shirt, some old bit of merch that's all found in a boot, 50p. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, hope, we're we're really looking forward to seeing you there. If you're coming from Germany, the Netherlands, or even America to come and see us, that that's amazing. Uh, just tore up and get your accommodation book because it's going quick. Keep saying mm-hmm. that, but unless you want to rock up and live in the boot of my car, is is probably all I can give you, or mm-hmm. or go head to, to top, top and tail. Actually, I can't offer that up because it's already taken. Yeah. <laughs> I've already given that exclusive prize yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah, nope, nope. I was thinking, nope, nope, you can't do that. Okay, all right. So top and tail with RGT and Mrs. RGT. Uh, <laughs> yes. Boogie, if you didn't know whether you could or couldn't, you know, you're the little dude that could. That's all I'm saying. Uh, although I was on Instagram the other day and I saw a, what looked like a teenager yeah. with a little bit of bum fluff. Masquerading as Game Boy Matic. Yes, I was looking at that this morning, actually. Yeah. Game Boy Matic is an immortal two-year-old, so who's yeah. this uncouth youth that's yeah. hanging around with Doogie these days? I don't yeah. know what's going on there. Time's going quick. He's almost like the human form of the show. If yeah. the show was a human, it'd yeah. be the same age as Game Boy Matty is right now, yeah. and that's scary, because yeah. it looks like he's ready to, to, to go to college. Yep. Feeling old. <sighs> Scary. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if I... you're going to OLL, come and say hi. We're very accommodating. They're nice people. Come and have a chat. Let us know who you are. Um, I went last year to their first event, and it was very good. It's something for everyone there. So whether you're a modern gamer, retro, they've got consoles galore set up. So you'll have a good time there. So yeah, come and, come and say hi. Promise of a good time offered by RGT is As always. surely reason for yeah. everybody to join. If you're that elusive listener in the Philippines, get yourself over. Get yourself over. And one time to meet us in public this year. So far, so well, Al. Don't blow it. Yep. Don't blow it. We may never do another one again. This is your one-time deal. Mm. One-time deal. Yep. What am I hoping to play? It's a no-brainer, isn't it? MLB, MLB until my until my eyes fall out. Uh, and then probably when I'm done, we'll get a little bit bored of that to mix it up a little bit. I might just play a little bit more MLB. Yeah, I can see you being on that lack of sleep this week. You're going to put about 100 <laughs> hours in this week. You're going to turn up for the show next week. Bags <sighs> under your eyes. Oh, GT, I can't stop thinking about MLB. Literally dead on my feet. Your hand's locked in the controller shape of the PS5. They're always locked in there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like game and claws now. 
That's what I refer to my hands as, <laughs> gaming claws. You're not a real gamer unless you're walking around like a crab. <laughs> For those who don't get the visual version, I'm now yep. doing a big crab impression. Very good crab, George. I, I don't know why. It felt like the right thing to do. <laughs> Other than OLL, yep. join the Discord. The usual banter we give. Um, it would always help with the show if you're a new listener and you haven't done yet. Wherever you get your podcasts, just go leave us a review, five stars, or however yep. many stars you think we deserve is me dictating. Give us five stars or nothing. You know, be constructive criticism, whatever. But if you want to pump the show, review the show. As I said at the start of the show, I think we've got a World Cup of countries going on at the minute, which keep popping up with different locations around the world. But the top ones, UK, Germany in second, the Netherlands, uh, USA in fourth, then the Netherlands, and then everybody else follows on after that. If you're one of those other countries that didn't even get a mention, get get all your family listening and downloading, push yourself yep. up the charts, and you're going to get that mention. Then there's obviously the status quo. Germany doesn't need to get many more listeners in that area before it's even bigger in Germany than we are in the UK. If you want that accolade, mind friend, and then just get it downloaded on every device you can possibly imagine. And don't just download one show. Download the whole back catalogue. There's so much in there. Recommendation from a show from the back catalogue, RGT? Um, I'd, I know we always say this one, but I did love it. That was the um, the history of the Xbox. That was fantastic. Do show. one more. Do another one. Um, I liked the because you done the PS2 one, didn't you? Right, way back. That was a brilliant one. The PS2 one. Mm. Yeah, I enjoyed. I love. I loved them style of ones back in the day. They were good, and they they're timeless because you can. You know, people are collecting for these systems. You want a bit of info? Want to know about it? Want to know the history? Just go back and download the old shows because it's all there for you. Okay, and I, I would say if you wanted to have a little bit of a window, we sometimes mention these characters in the show or these names and references to places. If you want to get a little bit of a, a sample of that, there's a the first Christmas special we did, um, the Farmerton Christmas Market live. Mm. Um, there's a, there's a, some surprises in there, I think, yeah. as well, which will keep your peak, interest peaked. Uh, and generally... I felt like that was in the early days a, a well produced and put together uh, episode. Uh, certainly was the crowning jewel in that year's uh, content that we pushed out. Mm. So, um, and it's got a sequel as well, straight after you can download the aftermath uh, to find out what happened in the cliffhanger at the end of that episode. So, uh, yeah, it's certainly be a, a deep run through of the law. A throwback to Tom, the original co host of the show. Um, to anyone who asks, he's doing okay. He's just you know, living his family life, doing his thing mm-hmm. uh, in the history of the show, in the law of the show. He's, he's uh, now being worshipped like a god. I think he's in the Amazon, right? South American Amazonian <laughs> tribe. Yeah, I think that fits the bill. Uh, <laughs> if you want to know a little bit more about that sort of weird stuff, series one and two, probably. Um, but yeah, I would also, say- if you've got any gamers who are friends, you know, pass the show on to them. Get them to listen to the show, get them to come into Discord. I mean, even... The guy when I was in, when I was coming back and I was in Ipswich on the way back from WASD, he served me in Starbucks and turned out to be a gamer. So I was giving him cards and his friends cards because he was really interested. So if you're listening, thanks for that. And the tea was lovely. So, uh, yeah. No doubt that card probably in the same burnt pet tradition as the one I gave to Shio Yoshida. So, uh, yeah, great news. Probably pronounced his name wrong. And again, sir. Suyashide, I am super sorry for interrupting. I'm super sorry for just all the ensuing embarrassment that came from that. And presenting you, instead of a, a firm man's handshake, for giving you piece, basically a piece of wet toilet paper just stroked across your palm. <laughs> Which the revulsion, wet. <laughs> y- yeah, clammy. The revulsion in his eyes was real. Um, something you can never unsee or unfeel, <laughs> if I'm honest with you. And I feel for him because as the giver of said shake, I felt so meek. You always feel like that after a shake. I normally feel a little bit more uplifted. Yeah. But in this situation, I felt... It was quite a weak shake. You didn't really put the effort in. Yeah, just kind yeah. of limped out at the end. It's just it didn't... a bit wet and not really... It's yeah. just a bit floppy. All right. All right. <laughs> no. 
I don't know what came over me, if I'm honest, and it certainly wants you, eh? Uh, and that's all we have time for this week, listeners. As always, thank you for your time. We look forward to the pleasure of speaking to you again next week. Until then, happy gaming. Remember, there's nothing wrong with being given the unofficial controller, nor an unofficial controller card at a highbrow gaming event. It's what you do with it that counts. <laughs> Shoe hey, subscribe. Speak to you soon. See you, see you RGT. See you later, George. Thank you.